I want to talk about um, the chemistry of uh, plastics on fire today. I want to start with a beach. Looks like a natural, normal beach, doesn't it? Some of the rocks on that beach are actu actually plastic. This is pyroplastic. It's a new material. It's formed by plastic in the beach uh, sediment, the sand, catching on fire or a, a nearby campfire, getting down to the coastal area. And, and I, don't, I don't usually throw rocks at people, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send you a rock. <laughs> the rocks are totally light. These actually came from Cornwall. The scientists were studying the rock formations and, and found these plastic rocks. Dr. Kanan, here. <laughs> it's amazing uh, material. It's new material. And uh, it's formed by fire. <clears throat> it's very hard to find these, but if you're good at doing that kind of investigation, you can go on a beach and find these rocks on any beach in the world now. They're all over the place. We are in the age, of course, the Anthropocene age, but are we in the Plasticine age or, or a Pyrocene age? We might be in a combination of these two. We've been using so much plastic for 70 years that plastic is now in the sediment layer all over the earth. It's visible in the fossil record, and that that layer is now starting to burn. It's important to remember that plastic is petroleum-based. Plastic is a petroleum material. It's tied, it tied intimately with fossil fuels and how we you know, use oil and gas. Exxon is the gas in your tank and also the plastic in your water bottle. The production of plastics actually uh, comes from splitting an ethane molecule into propylene and ethylene. And the, the building blocks of plastic come from petroleum. And what happened was the, the shale gas boom in the U.S. has created so much excess gas and the, about 40% of that production is going right into making plastic. And um, the industry is thrilled with this. They're pr promising to double the amount of plastic, virgin plastic, in our world in about eight years. And this is, of course, a billion dollar enterprise. You can see the trends have uh, gone up sharply since about 2010. Plastic has been increasing since 1950. You can see who's producing the most in this graphic. And of course, it's China and North America, Europe, the developed countries. It was estimated that we had produced about 300 million tons by 2017 and that we will reach 622 million tons by 2034. We first got very upset about plastic when they, they were discovered as big, in the big gyres of the ocean. This is macroplastic. Horrifying amounts of plastic are in the oceans, and it's predicted that the, by volume, plastic will outweigh fish by 2050, in fact. But actually, the oceans are not the biggest <coughs> problem. Plastic is all over the earth, it's uh, in the soil. It's, and this plastic uh, breaks down, not completely, but to small particles called microplastics that are smaller than five millimeters and also nanoplastics that are even smaller. Those plastics are found in the air, in water, drinking water, in tea, in beer, in wine, in, in food particularly, mussels and clams and oysters. And I eat, I eat oysters. I'm not saying we shouldn't be eating those things, but the microplastics are there. They are also getting into us. We cannot recycle this amount of plastic, and there's not an infrastructure for recycling, for starters. There's not an investment in the infrastructure for recycling. There's such a glut of plastic in the world and only less than 9% now is getting recycled because China stopped taking our e-waste. It was very convenient just to ship it all over there, you know, our plastic waste, our e-waste, <clears throat> and they were burning it for, and using it for fuel and so forth. But that market has dried up and 
uh, China is um, no longer an option. So what are we doing? We're now shipping all this plastic to Indonesia, Ghana, other Nigeria, other countries around the world, which are uh, very ill-equipped to deal with it. And, uh, and the pollution, massive pollution, is a result. So last year, in the fall, a, a group in Vienna discovered uh, microplastics in human waste. This caused a big scream of worry, and now the whole field has moved quickly to try to quantify plastic in the human body and determine what are the human health effects of plastic. So uh, this is a, a $64,000 question. Are, is all this plastic, the microplastics that's getting into us, is it clogging our, our arteries? Is it causing inflammation? Is it getting into our lungs? Is it getting across the blood brain barrier? What's, it, what's this doing inside the human body? And those questions are the frontier of research now on plastic today. The world is on fire from one end to the other. This is a NASA Terra satellite showing fires in real time. It's happening. This is about one month ago. And you see so much media coverage on these fires because the fires are frightening. They're wildfires. They're, I want to talk about different types of fires, but uh, the bushfire, the wildfire, is ripping across Africa. Drought is part of this. Climate change is uh, believed to be a driver because of the causing more intense and longer droughts and uh, really becoming or tinderbox for these fires. Fires are increasing in Brazil. Some of those are deliberately set for deforestation, so they're policy-driven fires. Bolivia is following suit to Brazil. These are tens of millions of acres of highly biodiverse land burning and killing animals. Land that would be absorbing carbon, for example, trees and forests and, 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 uh, and growth. And Indonesia is one of the worst places for fire. Indonesia has widespread burning of plastic waste, open burning of waste. And they, a lot of uh, 10 million children are uh, estimated to be at risk for health effects of those fires. We all have heard about the California fires starting, I think last year became big news, uh, the fire that destroyed the town of Paradise, California, the Camp Fire. And by now, in 2019, there are over 200,000 acres have burned. Uh, tens of thousands of homes and buildings are destroyed. Um, and almost 7,000 fire events have happened. Um, the, the Camp Fire was the deadliest fire in US history. Uh, 85 people died. About 50,000 people were trying to evacuate, and it totaled about 16 billion in damage. This is the wildland urban interface type of fire. Fire is coming from the forest. It's consuming homes, it's consuming buildings. So it's essentially becoming a structure fire. When it becomes a structure fire, it becomes very toxic. People are desperate to get out of these fires. And you know now right outside of LA, a fire was just controlled, but they're raging in the hillsides of California. The smoke is a problem. This is a satellite image of uh, smoke across the whole west coast, but the smoke travels thousands of miles and has wound up in New York from the, the, from the LA fire this year. This is the city of San Francisco that was in smoke for weeks after the Paradise Fire. People were wearing masks. They were unable to go outdoors. They couldn't exercise. And this is California, remember. This is a California fire, someone watching the smoke. And here we have our new world in the age of fire. And Australia now has caught on fire this year. Over two and a half million acres have burned 150 fires are still burning in Australia. New South Wales is hit the hardest. They've lost a tremendous amount of land. Six people have died. Over 600 homes are destroyed. And 
still burning. Now the smoke from those fires is crossing into the Atlantic. This is a satellite image from Japan showing the fire from Australia moving in, into the Atlantic from Pacific. Open waste burning is another type of fire, very toxic kind of fire. About 41% of the garbage in the world is burned and contains large amounts of plastic, larger and larger amounts, um, over 620 million tons of plastic waste is burned annually. E-waste fires are another kind. They are extremely hazardous. This is a, a fire pit in Ghana, which is one of the worst places outside of Accra. And Dr. Kane and I know someone from Ghana who's been researching this and uh, knows very much about it. The idea is to set on, on fire a tire and uh, make it burn hot, hot, hot and throw your computers into it. So it started with a tire. Now they're chopping up the styrofoam box and throwing that in because that creates a very hot burn. And that's what they're trying to, to achieve. This is, this is a common practice, by the way. It goes on every day. It's all over Indonesia and Ghana. So they're saying this is the final product. This is where they put the the plastic TV and the other items in there to, to melt. And then they're going to pull out the metals and the, the wiring, the copper. So this is just another day in Ghana and um, this is good business. Another kind of fire that is, is hazardous and of concern is using plastic to start a cooking fire. Very common in Indonesia. People do it in their homes. And this is one of 30 commercial tofu plants where they are using plastic to fire up, uh, to cr uh, cook the tofu. This is the local economy. All this plastic is dumped in the yard and then fed into the big stove. And then from this fire comes the plastic and comes all the smoke that hovers over the village constantly. It's black smoke, toxic smoke. And it has contaminated not only the tofu, but also the food web around this area. A recent study was done looking at chicken eggs and um, found very high levels of dioxin in, in those eggs. So what about fire chemistry? What are we actually talking about when we talk about the toxicity of this? I wanted to look into this specifically by the type of fire with, and just to show you what the difference is. In the bushfire alone, not the combination, you've got particulates, PAHs, your hydrocarbons, VOCs, and some of these are carcinogenic, formaldehyde, benzene. This is the chemistry of that kind of fire. This is the least toxic of fire. Open waste burning is considerably more toxic. You have particulate matter and then you start to pick up with the PAHs, VOCs, uh, the gases, uh, methoxyphenols, and the, the halogenated compounds, the brominated, chlorinated compounds, flame retardants, PCBs, plasticizers, phthalates, and so forth, vinyl chloride. That's the way, how open waste burning looks. And that's the kind of fire we're looking at in the village of Tropodo in Indonesia when they're burning this plastic to cook in open waste. E-waste burning is even worse. It's more concentrated. You have a few more compounds plus the heavy metals, more complex. You have more of the PFASs, the polyfluorinated compounds, that are totally problematic because it's such a strong bond. They're very persistent. They last for hundreds of years and so stay in the environment and in the food chain and highly toxic. And structure fires contain pretty much everything. So when your home is burning, a lot of plastic is burning. This is a structure fire chemistry.
And um, you can see the complexity of that fire. And in that mix, a number of carcinogens, the halogenated flame retardants, the dioxins furans, perfluorinated compounds, PCBs, phthalates, some of the metals. And the known toxic effects of those are cancer, hematotoxicity, immunotoxicity, all the toxicities, endocrine disruption, neurodevelopmental effects, and so on. And this is, of course, a huge literature and just a summary. But the to this is the toxicity of that chemistry that we just looked at. So I have worked on uh, research to determine what firefighters absorb into their bodies when they're fire fighting fires. And this particular cohort, firefighters, I believe, are defining the risk of plastic on fire for us. This is showing fire response, and just look at the top of the ceiling for a minute. It, a foam couch is burning. Okay, so what we just saw, that is uh, a plastic fire smoke uh, and highly toxic. That's coming right off of a couch with foam furniture that's got a not just plasticizers, but also a lot of additive chemicals. And that's why today's fires are so toxic and particularly come from concentrated amounts of plastics. Firefighters are exposed every way you can think of, inhalation, ingestion, and by the uh, skin absorption particularly, during all phases of firefighting, suppression, overhaul, the day after inspection, by multiple pathways, and heat makes this worse. For every five degrees increase in skin temperature, the skin pores open up, and you get a 400% increase in absorption. It's like taking a toxic sauna. The toxicity lasts long after the fire goes out, and this is where, it, it, in overhaul, where the firefighters go in and they chunk off pieces of wood or plastic to see if the fire's going to reignite. It's a very dangerous time. Firefighters used to not wear their respirators during this phase. And it turned out this was an incredibly bad idea because you have um, carcinogens still in this, in this smoke. And this is an important point for us to realize when we talk about wildfire structure fires, wildfire structure fire combo, and see the smoke exposure for millions of people. There's ongoing exposure in the clothing. These are the hoods that go underneath the gear of a firefighter. It goes around the neck and the head. And this is the one in the middle, of course, is unworn. And this, these two on the side have been worn one time. Cancer is a major killer of firefighters that we're seeing uh, multiple cancers, up to 30 different kinds of cancer in firefighters with a short latency of sometimes five years. And for line of duty deaths, active duty death, cancer contributes 63% of the, those deaths. It did not used to be that bad. It used to be that firefighters were more at risk for a heart attack or an accident, falling off of a ladder injuring themselves. Now it's cancer all the way. This has started, you can see, it starts to rise about 1990, 19, very low though, and now it's creeped up to 2014. This is a trend. This um, is about the same parallel to a time when we started using more chemicals in the home, particularly flame retardants and this is the, some of the literature on the site-specific cancers. There have been these very large studies with tens of thousands of people in them, and you can see each study found, finds different kinds of uh, cancer risk, but um, taken together, um, it has been enough evidence to push legislation, and it's um, 
<clears throat> legislation that is in almost 30 to 40 states now. It's presumptive cancer legislation that says after you're a firefighter for five years in active duty, you're at uh, risk for blank number of cancers, and it, it varies by state. But I, I know in Maine it's uh, 10 cancers. Uh, in other states, it go up to 20, 30 cancers. It's because of the multiple exposure routes and the different kind of uh, chemicals, multiple chemicals that firefighters only do not get only one kind of cancer. And we really knew this a long time ago. We, Percival Pott wrote about this in 1775 when he discovered the connection between scrotal cancer in the chimney sweeps and the soot. And you know, the chimney sweeps were small boys and of a, of a, of a young age, they had to be small enough to go through the chimney. And they were wearing no clothing so they could get down the chimney so and back up. And so a, a law was passed after Pot discovered this. And they, in England, they passed a law that said that the chimney sweeps had to wear clothing had to wear loose clothing, and that would protect them from this, this cancer. Of course, it didn't. But here we, firefighters used to, used to, want to be heroes. This is a job that attracts people that want to save people. They want to be heroic. They take risks. They train all their lives to do this. And um, they used to want to be covered with black when they came out of a fire because it meant that they were the bravest, bravest guy. They, they were fighting the fire. They were the, the warriors of the fire, right? They are not thinking that way today. Our study, which I did in collaboration with Dr. Cannon's lab, found carcinogens elevated in the blood after firefighting. And we published this in 2013. It was the first and probably the largest assessment of chemicals in firefighters' blood. A couple of features of what we found, and I want to go through this quickly. We found that the, these firefighters from California had levels of the brominated flame retardants, the polybrominated diphenyl ethers, were about two to three times higher than general population levels. Okay, so that's elevated. DECA BDE is the highly brominated diphenyl ether, and it's a neurotoxin and is probably carcinogenic. We found the firefighters had very different patterns than normal average population people. You and I could be exposed to DECA, a, a lot of it today, and within two weeks we can metabolize it. You can break it down quickly. But the firefighters are exposed chronically day in, day out to this, and they can never get rid of it. So, so you see this as a signature of firefighting, and it's also very high in dust. It's high in the dust in every fire station because they bring it in on their gear. The same pattern turned up in this DECA pattern in e-waste workers, most of whom, whom are children. Now, why is that? Because children are preferred to be the workers, the recyclers because they have small hands, so they can get into the TV and pull it apart. But here's the pattern in the children. You can see this is, these are children in Giyu, a town in China, in the nearby town also. So the proportion of um, ruminated diphenyl ether is very high in DECA. And this is not, not a good thing. It means that it, it's a sign of that chronic, uh, overwhelming exposure that your body can't get rid of. We also found high level of the brominated dioxins in, the fire, in some of the firefighters, really a hundred times higher than population levels and very similar to foam workers. And this is a German study. Foam workers are standing over a big vat of plastic foam and stirring it. And so it's a thermal process that's off-gassing these dioxins. And we also then found high levels of the C8 Teflon chemical, PFOA. And this is the 
data, you see it is elevated and similar to, it actually higher than the workers on the, no, I'm sorry, excuse me. It, it, it was lower than the World Trade Center workers, but it is el more elevated. It's elevated compared to population levels. And this is a carcinogenic uh, compound, you know, that's caused so much um, contamination of groundwater all over the country from uh, firefighting foam contains this compound. And uh, it's contaminated almost every military base in the country and aviation centers too because it's used to spray down <clears throat> large equipment and, um, and planes. So the cancer risk is related to exposure to plastic fire smoke. And this is an, extra an extrapolation from the firefighters as a cohort. You can say it's circumstantial, but it's a very strong connection to plastic fire and a high risk for cancer. You've got the presence of plastics in the, in the homes, in the structures, buildings. You've got the absorption during heat. Everybody's body, when you're in a fire, your body's absorbing more of the smoke. Um, <clears throat> and the high risk uh, in firefighters now extends to millions of people who are affected by these uh, wildfires and wildfire urban interface fires, not to mention the, these intentional fires, the EWAs. So children all over the world, this is Nepal, are at, at high risk, I would say extreme risk. Uh, very small children are exposed to e-waste, burning e-waste, open uh, plastic waste burning, and the research is very scarce. This is a huge area where there's very little data and there's an enormous urgent need for data. This is one of the studies that was done in 2008 that showed uh, children that in an erased region who were working on the fire had higher blood levels of lead and cadmium and also blood levels in the, were greater than the EPA threshold for effects. So this put, they're shorter for their age, so that's a developmental effect too. This puts children at risk for all kinds of illnesses, immune problems, diseases, developmental problems, and the children really don't have a chance. They are forced to work with the families in these dumps. And they go out in the morning and they come back at night and they're looking for something of value in the dump. They're scavengers, that's their job. It's 24 seven exposure because very often the families live right on the dump or next to the dump. So there have been some reports of uh, DNA breaks, uh, cancer, uh, developmental issues and disease in these children and they many of them are uh, below the age of five so um, they do not live long this is Malaysia I wanted to show this because you see how these children interact with the plastic they have no fear of burning this plastic there's an enormous need for education, and they're starting fires to fight it. Why? Because their mother does this to start a cooking fire. Okay, so I, I think we've gotten to enough depression, depressing information. Let's see what hope is on the horizon. Uh, at the Plastic Health Summit in Amsterdam in October, uh, one of the things about plastic is we are so dependent on it. And plastic, from the day we started using it, solves so many problems. It's so convenient, it's lightweight, it keeps food clean. It does so many things for us. But now that it's a runaway issue, now we have to backtrack and say, some people say we've made a mistake in design. We've made a mistake in, in choice of material. It turns out to be incredibly toxic, this material. Many groups, I don't know of any of them that are heavily funded, but they're startup groups trying to use 
different biological materials. Renewable energy outlook is, is good. I, th I think renewable energy is predicted to supply 80% of our total electricity by 2050. And so <coughs> another good thing that happened yesterday, I think, was uh, Europe has enacted a global ban on exporting e-waste, hazardous waste, to developing countries. And of course, our country opposes this ban. Um, and we're the biggest uh, e-waste producer in the world. But nevertheless, uh, the, this initiative in Europe is going to drive some uh, change there. And uh, those countries, you saw that the conditions are so, so terrible and they have no infrastructure. They have no way of dealing with the mountains and mountains of plastic that they get from developed countries like ourselves. I think for ourselves, our, for scientists, for public health, our frontier is here. I think this is something we need to take on. Research is urgently needed. There's so little data on these children. I think it's important now to connect the dots about plastic, about plastic and petroleum, about plastic and petroleum and, and fossil fuels. And what is driving all this? Billions and billions of dollars. You know, the plastic industry is, is just booming along, and they want to now double the amount of plastic in our world. How are we going to handle that? How are these children going to handle that?